Yeah, I was, exp yeah, I was exposed to it. Uh, they were spraying that Agent Orange crap all the way, all over the place. There's no guarantees. From the moment you're born to the moment you die, there's no guarantees. It's ter war is a terrible thing. I mean, people dying, that's terrible. And the way they died, you know, it's, it's an unquestionable why, why embellish something that, you know, death is death, but why embellish it? You know, I didn't care to talk about it. I didn't care to do anything about it. I still don't really care to talk about it. It's, you know, you did what you did, and that's it. Simple. Life goes on. I wasn't a little kid anymore. Okay? I was at grips with reality. You know. Ken, I remember everything. And I will, for the rest of my natural life, remember every. You keep saying, do you remember? Oh, I remember. I was transferred in 68, in the August of 68. 26th of when I was supposed to get out due to a glitch, naturally, in the military. I had to wait till the 27th. But I got to, uh, what I got to uh, do, I was in, transferred to Treasure Island. Treasure Island, Navy, Naval Station. That's right in the middle of San Francisco Bay, Treasure Island. And I spent the uh, last week there mustering out. You know, that's where they try to make you a civilian again. <laughs> what a joke. Uh, you know, they give you your stuff and uh, your sea bag and your, your supplies and, you know, a lot of paperwork. A lot of signature writing, signature and crap, military stuff. And you must straight out. And the first thing they told you is when you get on that bus and leave Treasure Island, headed for San Francisco Airport, don't do anything in front of the front gate. See, some guys, dummies, would muster out and walk out the gate and throw the uniform down, take the shirt off and start jumping up and down, giving them a signal like that, sh shooting them the bird. And guess what? There's a little clause there that says, you aren't officially out of the service for 24 hours. So they can pick your ass up, bring you back in and put you in the brig or do anything they want. And when they got you, you ain't gonna do nothing. Last days, yeah, last days. At San Francisco Airport, they threw rotten tomatoes at you. Yelling out, yelling out baby killer and all that. No, nobody gave, nobody gave me anything either way, you know, just, you know. Well, then I started to go to Rack Valley College. Fall of 68, and that was when the, was the October, was it? Yeah, that's when, uh, what's his name, was running for president, Hum Humphrey. And the chair declares that Vice President Hubert Humphrey is the Democratic president candidate of the United States. <laughs> Was it 
of 68, yeah. he yeah. was running for president. You know, the, scene, the thing was at that time, dump the hump, dump the hump, dump the hump. And uh, that was that Chicago uh, Democratic Convention where Go in and get your head, head collaborate. I'm glad I didn't. Know. Some of the guys, I, I was blind to the uh, Vietnam Vets, the Rock Valley Vets Club at the time. And a couple of those guys went, but I didn't go. I didn't care. Yeah, I don't know. Start dating girls, I guess. That's how I readjusted. But with my Naval attitude. It wasn't high school, get out of high school attitude, it was a naval attitude. Can you kind of explain what you mean by that? Uh oh, my wife's looking at me. I don't know. I reflect, I plead the fifth here. Yeah, I, yeah, I might say that because every time I get a job, boss say something to me, I didn't like it, I quit, went on the next job. At that time, in 1968, you could get a job anywhere and walk down the street two days later and get another job somewhere else. You know, it was easy to get a job. All they wanted was a warm body doing something, you know. I did some spot welding. I did, uh, let's see. I did some rivet work, you know. I don't know. Probably a lost time in my life. I remember coming back. Yeah, I came back. I went, took a taxi home. My wife, my mother got, broke out in tears, crying. She's so happy to see her little baby boy. A little tearful. My immediate family? Yes. Does that include the dog? I'm the youngest of the family. Yeah, I had three sisters. Um, Lola, Larry, and Curly. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's normal childhood, I guess. I mean, you know, uh, you know. What's important to any kid's childhood? In those days, eh, we played. Today, kids go out and play video games all day. They never see the outside. I know, my son lives in Vegas, and the kids in their neighborhood, there's no kids outside. They're all inside on their gizmos. When I grew up, there was no such thing. We had to invent our own game. You ever hear of kick the can? Huh? Maybe they have it. <laughs> you know, and things like that. Uh, hide and go seek. You remember that game? Yeah. Stay out of trouble there? No. Oh, huh. you don't stay out of trouble. You enjoy trouble. We used to go swimming down the old J.I. Keys plant. That's down on Independence Avenue. Central, off the central there now. I, I guess to be pressed on you. Know. There was a dam down there. We used to go swimming down there. We also swam in the creek at uh, what Am what is Amrock Company now. Well, it's all tore down now. But we used to go, had a tire and we swung out. We used to wear our birthday suits for our swimmings. Anyways, so when I was about 11 or 12, we thought we'd go swimming one summer. And me and my friends, we are gonna go down, down to the swimming there and uh, at the OJ at Keys plant. And the girls said, hey, we wanna come. I said, well, go ahead, come ahead, but you gotta wear your birthday suits. So, guess what? I went swimming, and so did they. A 
about high school? How was how was uh, how was high school for you? It's a brand new school, brand new. You know, paint it and write on the walls. You know. No, let's see. I went to oh yeah, I went to Wilson my freshman year, ninth grade. I went to Wilson, and then sixty one to sixty two was sophomore year. Yeah, I was at Auburn. What kind of student were you? That was an asshole. I don't know. I don't know what kind of student I am. I, you know, did normal things. On the summertime, we went down, find somebody who drive. Went down to Lake Louise. You know, went swimming there and up to Pearl Lake. You know, summertime. You know. It is a great personal honor for me to be here today to take part in a ceremony that is unique in American history. Never before has a full division been cited by the War Department in the name of the President for gallantry in action. This day marks the beginning of a new tradition in the American Army. With that tradition, therefore, will always be associated the name of the 101st Airborne Division and of Bastogne. You know what they found out? The hundred first guys could die just as quick as everybody else. Yeah. So so much for the hundred first. <laughs> well, the, at the time the dra draft was in full swing, I enlisted because the reason I enlisted was because everybody else. A couple of my friends were going in the army, they got drafted. And I said, ain't no way I'm going into the army and get drafted because I know what's going to happen. I'm going to be sent to Vietnam. I'm smart. I'm going to join the Navy. The Navy, they just sail around on ships. Just wrong. So I joined the Navy. You know, join the Navy. See the world, grow on every port. Hey, you know. Oh, that was a mind waking experience. Especially the first morning, four o'clock in the morning, some guy comes rattling on garbage can, waking everybody up. Four o'clock in the morning. And we just got to bed about the first day there about nine o'clock at night and four o'clock in the morning. You know, never woken up then that fashion and to get up. Make your make your bed, your bunk, and then they march you to Chow. Eighty men to a company, and to march in cadence all the way to Chow. Eat Chow, come out. You gotta wait in line in groups, and then on your fifth week in basic, everybody had uh, had to work in the Chow hall, except some guys got excluded. I was one of the late ones. So when the other guys had to get up at three in the morning to be in the chow hall by four, you know, to set up everything by 3.30, I got to sleep in until six or seven. <laughs> I felt lucky. So uh, how did you adapt to this sort of life? I mean, waking up at anywhere between 3.30 or seven. What do you mean adapt? You ha what do you mean adapt? You adapt because that's it. You don't get it. You don't get up. Your ass is grass. The company commander makes sure of that. Don't worry. You when you got when they wake you up, you best get up. I just realized that uh, boot camp was different than civilian life. When I had to do push-ups on my knuckles. When I had I, we were in company 515, and as a reward for doing a good job in inspection. We only have to do 515 jumping jacks with M1 rifle over our head. If we didn't do a good job, we'd have to do double that, 1,000. I was in the best shape in the world coming out of basic training. I mean, I, physically, I was in good shape. <laughs> Amazing. I, I could do 1,000 jumping jacks with a one M1 rifle over my head, and I wouldn't be exhausted. Our company commander had a razor blade, a Gillette razor blade, and every morning he held it up. And he swore 
that he was going to write Gillette Razor for Gillette Razor Razor Company that he was going to shave 80 guys with the same razor. So you best have a good shave. Because if he found one little hair on your face, he was going to shave you with it. And he would do it. And he did it to a couple of guys. But he didn't use any water or soap. He just whapped across their face. Yeah, they, they get the message. My company commander told us when you when you take a razor blade and you're going to kill yourself, don't cut this way. Cut along the vein so you'll bleed fast. Nobody did it. He was very nice to us. See, basic training is there for one reason. That's to break you. They want you to go nuts. They want you to lose it. They want you to kill yourself because they don't want to send the guys through basic training, graduate, and send them to Vietnam, and in a battlefield situation, to lose it, go nuts, and maybe kill some of their friends. You know, that's the idea of basic training. I didn't go to A school. I went right out into the fleet. I was sent to the USS Tulare in December of 64 after basic training. December 12th, I believe, I reported aboard ship. And I was assigned the boiler room, boiler tender. And we, in the spring of 65 is when we left San Diego and went to Pearl and picked up supplies and headed for Vietnam. What was life like in the boiler room? Hot, dirty, stinking. You ever want the dirtiest job in the world? To me, to, when the boilers cooled down, it was a D-modified type boiler. I don't know if you think of a D, letter D. Anyways, there's 1,300 tubes in that boiler. And you have to go in with a uh, saturated steam and clean and scrape the inside of that boiler at least every once every six months to get all the crud off the tubes because it affects the heating of the steam. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Off the coast of Okinawa in 65, we were in between two hurricanes. And man, I was sick. I was so sick, I couldn't even move. And believe, I ain't embellishing this one. Man, I was sick. I couldn't even move, I just laid there. But after that, I was never seasick again. Never. And they had Marines come aboard ship, you know. Oh, tough Marines, man. We can kick ass anytime we want. Hey, guess what? When we got them in the troop compartments four and a half, and we were going out to sea, and we we're going all across the ocean, and we hit some rough weather, especially if you take the Arctic Circle around, it's pretty rough seas up there. And you're, you go up on one side and down on the other, up on one side, down on the other. You list, list to the right, port side, starboard side you go down, port side you come up, starboard side you come down. And there were some Marines that were tough, but guess what? They were sicker than a dog. And the, they were so sick, the guy on the top rack would puke, literally puke, you wanna hear this? Literally puke on the guy below. Now that's sick, huh? He was sick to sick. When you were delivering things up the river, have you ever, did you ever have to witness combat? Yes. I had to witness a 50 cal, people shooting at my ass and me grabbing a 50 caliber and shooting back. Now, I didn't really enjoy that. That's not fun. War is not fun. 
When you hear some guy screaming because he's been shot with a 50, he's shot. He's definitely shot. But I didn't go to check to see what I hit. We came under fire coming down the river, headed towards the sea. Uh, we radioed in. We were under fire. The Navy had this thing. Are you ready for this? They had this thing that if you get into a combat situation and they're shooting at you, call into the command and ask if you can fire back because we don't want you to hit any friendlies. Guy shooting at you and call him friendly? Well, there used to be a guy in Da Nang that used to cut your hair. That was rumored that he cut your hair during the day and then he'd go out and shoot at your ass at night. <laughs> but there's no friendlies. Somebody trying to kill you? You're supposed to call in, well, I don't know if we should shoot back. He might be a friendly. We didn't do that. In 68, we hauled beer. 80 cases to a pallet. Six to eight pallets in the boat. And we hauled them up the river to Alyssa Man's Clubs and ostrich clubs along the way uh, up the river. You know, the river wound its way up and we, just, we had a net, like a fishing net, and we put a case of, in the net and we hauled a, along the side of the craft in the water, nice and cold. After an hour or so, it was ready to go. And so we basically drank our way up the river. After the Tet Offensive, did you guys run any more missions up that, or is that when you guys kind of stopped in the Elks? No, that's when God, in his infinite wisdom, looked down on me and smiled and said, Son, you've been through enough. I'm going to do you a favor. I got transferred off the ship. I got transferred to the Master of Arms Force in Yokosuka, Japan where I stood in one and 25 duty section. That meant one four hour shift every 25 days. But <clears throat> during loading supplies to send to shore, Agent Orange was in a 55 gallon drum. And there's probably uh, probably six, maybe ten or twelve barrels in the, in the LCM. And sometimes, when the lower it down in a net cargo net, you drop it down, and then you four or five guys load it up, take it off that out of the net, and roll it off, and set it up, try to set it up. And this is why the I was kind of going up and down with the waves, you know, around maybe 10 miles offshore, doing this shit, and then loading it up. And sometimes these barrels would pop open, okay? And the powder would fall down, and, the, and we were given a hand, <laughs> we were given a broom and a little dustpan, and we were told to scoop it up with our hands and dump it back into the barrel. Nobody said anything. You know, there was no, oh, don't touch that. You know, you do what you're told. One thing you do in any service, you do what you're told. No questions asked. You don't ask. If you ask, it might cost you a lot. How much Agent Orange was being brought over? Was that something that was tons, on every, tons. every ship? Every time we come make a run, we bring barrels and barrels of that crap. You're talking hundreds of barrels, thousands? Yeah, thousands of barrels, yeah. Yeah. And they'd spray it over. When they, when they come in and spray with a helicopter, they wouldn't just spray the force. They'd spray the whole thing, whatever's there. they just spray it around. It landed on guys, you know, out in the, some of these guys suffered. I mean, 
and the, you go out and patrol, and uh, they lay in the, not me, but they lay in the field, a rice paddy, waiting for Charlie to walk by, and they lay there for a couple hours in that rice paddy. And that's at the same time, their legs were exposed to the, in the water, and what would they get on their legs? Leeches, sucking their blood while they're waiting for Charlie to walk by. Rain coming down, you know that was a gore as hell. Man. It's it's horrible. You know to go through a lot of that crap they had to go through, and or you, especially on recon, those guys on recon they had to go out feel in the bush looking for Charlie. And they had to be careful every time the step they took. A lot of guys lost their legs or arms. You know. Was it fun to, to leave half your gut or your leg in a rice paddy? It wasn't fun. It's no fun. War is no fun. War is a horrible thing because you might be laying there wounded and you could be dying because you wouldn't get medical help right away. You know, infection sets in. Yeah. No, they had. Yeah, I suppose they had some validity. I mean, shit. Nobody wants to go to go and get killed. Nobody wants to die. And that's basically what they're doing. And you know what kills me about it? What kills me about Vietnam, I'll tell you what kills me about Vietnam, is that I can go to Coe's department store and buy a shirt made in South Vietnam. Why should I buy a shirt made in South Vietnam? 57,000 guys died. So I can buy a shirt made in South Vietnam? That's bullshit. That's bullshit. Vietnam's a joke, as far as I'm concerned. It's not the people there that are in South Vietnam now that it's, it's their fault. You know, they weren't in, half, most of them weren't even born then. But I'm saying that, you know, and there are a couple, I belong to a Vietnam Honor Society. A couple of the guys on that group have gone back on a tour of South Vietnam. It's bullshit. I ain't going back to a country that killed 57,000 guys, tried to kill my ass. Is this some, this attitude, did you have it? Were you thinking about that while you were serving? Or no. is this something that you This is something I took up after I left Vietnam. This is something that has always gnawed at my ass that 50, you know, 57,000 guys died when I buy a shirt. That's why I don't buy anything made in South Vietnam. I won't. Because, yeah, these guys died. Their immortality will be lost to the ages. They don't have, never have kids, they don't have grandkids, they have nothing except six feet down. For what? So I can buy this shirt. <laughs> kind of dumbass reason to buy a shirt. What complications have you had from your exposure to Agent Orange? I got diabetes. My kidneys aren't working too well. I have to decatheterize myself every morning, every during the day and at night. You know what that means? Catheterizing yourself. Do you understand what that is? Huh? There's a tube, a long tube, about this long. It's about real small. And I gotta stick it up my dick all the way up into my gut to urinate every morning, every night. Sometimes during the night, I have to stick it up because nothing else works. So I have to, in order to take a pee, I have to stick that thing all the way into my gut. Can you kind of explain the struggle it was to get, uh, you know, disability from the VA? <laughs> yeah, you got to stand there and ask 24-7. You got to go out, they got a thing out in Los, Los Parker, the armory where the VA is uh, representative. And you got to go out there, every, you go out there every month you just hound them, you pound them, and they send you to Chicago or you send you up to Madison 
for tests. They test here, test there. You know, it's long. It's like, we don't really believe you deserve any of this. You enlisted in the Navy. Yes, I did. Hoping that you would not go to Vietnam. That's right. Got sent to Vietnam. Good plan, huh? Are you still happy that you enlisted in the Navy? Yeah, yeah. I'm so happy I left the Navy. Yeah. What? No. Sports. Yeah, I was on a ship, all right. Thank you, girl. John Lester's story has really changed my life. I mean, I've done some editing before, but nothing to this caliber or on this topic. It was definitely very different for me, but I enjoyed it despite all the very hard moments. It challenged me in ways I did not think it would. I never really sought out to learn about past wars or anything like that. However, John's story was so intriguing to me. Seeing a first person experience like that was definitely very eye-opening. I am grateful for this experience, so thank you, John, for sharing such a personal part of your life and allowing me to share it with others. Did you ever uh, stay in contact with your family and friends at all? Well, I didn't... It wasn't that. People didn't write. I wrote letters to my mom and dad, yeah. I didn't, I had a girlfriend, you know. She sent me, I don't know how true it is. She sent me, this is 1968, right? The spring of 68. My birthday was April of 68. And she sent me a bill of sales and the keys to a brand new 1968 Pontiac Firebird convertible with a 350. And you know what I did? I sent the keys back to her and said, no thanks. You know why? Because that meant marriage and I wasn't about to get married. And the other guys on the ship thought I was nuts. Why didn't you have to get married? Huh? Why didn't I was too young. I was only 23 years old. I was too young. I want to enjoy life, dude. I want to be a civilian again and enjoy life.